Hello everyone, welcome to the Street Crime UK YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more content. Today's video is slightly different to our normal content, as today's case takes place hundreds of years ago. It's been over 200 years since the last execution in Pembrokeshire. In 1821, at Haverford West Castle, murderer William Roblin had been hanged after murdering a former employee, William Davis after a drunken dispute over unpaid wages. So who was William Roblin? William Roblin has achieved a rather infamous reputation, especially within the Welsh area in which he lived. After being the last person to be executed in Pembrokeshire, however, Mr Roblin's tale is one filled with uncertainty. Having been the talk of the town for so long, fabrications surrounding his name have been very popular. Though this is what we do know about this controversial figure. William Roblin was born in 1776 in Burton, Pembrokeshire, Wales, to a poor farmer called Richard Roblin. However, in his adult life, Mr Roblin struggled to settle down into a single job due to suffering from a crippling drinking problem. Eventually, Mr. Roblin was able to get by running an inn at his Deep Lake farm. It was there he also oversaw an alehouse known as Homebound. Homebound has been described as a veritable vortex sucking in vicious tales of murder and debauchery. Mr. Roblin had been previously linked with several other crimes before shooting his former employee. An Irish hawker had visited his Homebound and was never seen again. William Roblin was later accused of secretly murdering the Irishman and had also been previously linked with the body of an unknown woman found within the orchard of his Deep Lake farm. Mr. Roblin was described by locals as having a fiery temper with a psychopathic rage. William Roblin was born in the rural idyll of Martel Tui in 1776 in Pembrokeshire, Wales. Pembrokeshire is a county in the southwest of Wales known for its coastal landscapes and excessive agricultural significance. Even today, 86% of Pembrokeshire land is focused on oil, agriculture and tourism. Within Mr Roblin's own hometown, there is no known record of his baptism. Mr Roblin was often accused of hating religions by locals. This alleged indifference to Christianity had only further ruined his reputation in his hometown of Pembrokeshire. Though, as well as this, William Roblin was involved in drunkenness, blasphemy and failure to properly observe the Holy Day. Otherwise known as the Day of the Sabbath, he would spend his Sundays instead cockfighting, dogfighting and sometimes outdoor gambling, much to the town's disapproval. Such activities were carried out with recklessness that got Mr Roblin a bad reputation amongst the Pembrokeshire people. From this, many people suggest that William's later motivations for the murders he was accused of were much easier to understand. Mr. Roblin was an outcast who didn't have much of an easy life, though it didn't excuse the crime or crimes that he committed. In some ways, Mr. Roblin could be seen as a rather tragic character, having turned a drink in this way. Some say that he was clearly attempting to escape his mundane, everyday life, though he eventually failed, as this drinking problem had been a major factor that led to his untimely death. However, with his fiery temper, drinking had only worsened things for Mr. Roblin, as his emotions were more susceptible to slipping away and growing into something he himself could not control. Many townsfolk, including his wife Margaret Roblin, admitted this in several reports concerning Mr. Roblin. In 1814, Mr. Roblin had found a job as a servant, most likely agricultural, to Richard Barzy on a family farm. Barzy had apparently often scolded Mr. Roblin for his brutal treatment of the animals on the farm. Mr. Roblin was recalled having been especially cruel to the animals after drinking, so Barzy threatened William with termination unless he changed his ways. Though Barzy never went through with his threat, as he suddenly died shortly after, on the 27th of February 1814, aged 71. There had been no clear evidence of foul play, and no cause of death, although rumours arose that the death was under suspicious circumstances, and that Mr. Roblin may have been to blame for the death. Furthermore, a large portion of Barzy's money that he kept in his house had also disappeared around a similar time. This had never been directly linked to William Roblin, though rumours only grew concerning this mystery. This, of course, only worked to further ruin Mr. Roblin's reputation even more. While working at that farm, Mr. Roblin met his future wife Margaret, who was also working there at the time. The couple courted and married the following year of meeting, with the marriage taking place at St. Petrock's Church, 
Soon after their marriage, they took a lease of a small farm that they called Deep Lake Farm in Oosmaston Parish, three miles from Haverford West. There, the couple also ran a public house in 1811. An alehouse licenses show how John Page opened an alehouse there in 1815, so many people suspect that Page was later seceded by William Roblin in 1816. In the four or so years that Mr. Roblin ran the inn and lived in Deep Lake Farm, he attracted more of an undesirable reputation compared to before. Mr. Roblin had by then become a figure in the town who no one wanted to associate with. William became well known to break the bounds of the law for whoever he considered being his enemies or whoever offended him, however small the disagreement. With his wife, Williams had a single daughter known as Little Margaret. She had been described as sweet and an interesting girl in her fourth year at the time of Mr. Roblin's execution. Throughout his life, Mr. Roblin would also cart materials for local farmers and buildings to maintain a healthy income for the Roblin's family. However, during such deliveries, Mr. Roblin would beat his horse so badly that Mr. Jones, the prison governor, had to warn William not to do it again. Otherwise, he threatened that Mr. Roblin would be forced to stand in front of a magistrate. In response, Mr. Roblin pointedly replied that it was his own horse. Nevertheless, William thankfully never did it again, at least not in front of Mr. Jones. So, what crime did Mr. Roblin commit that caused him to be hung? William Roblin was sentenced to death by hanging after shooting a former employee in the head with a gun in a mad fury. It happened during one day in 1820, where Mr. Roblin fell into a heavy argument with his eventual victim, William Davis. However, Mr. Davis wasn't all that good of a person either. Mr. Davis was also described as hot-headed and bad-tempered, likewise to Mr. Roblin. Mr. Davis was known for having a hair lip and had actually previously served a one-year sentence for an abhorrent crime. In March 1818, Mr. Davis had been convicted of flaying a calf whilst it was still alive. From this, Mr. Davis spent a year in custody and was released on the 10th of March 1819. Both Mr. Davis and Mr. Roblin were also known to have had bad blood on account of Mr. Roblin's bad habit and attitude, as well as unpaid wages that Mr. Roblin had failed to fix. Both intoxicated, they started to argue over unpaid wages during Mr. Davis's time working in the Deep Lake Farm under William Roblin. Mr. Roblin and Mr. Davis almost got physical with each other, but were prevented from doing so by a passerby. This was because one of the lime burners who was working there at the time split up the pair. Instead, both Mr. Roblin and Mr. Davies left town to resume the argument a couple miles outside of it. From this point, the argument grew worse and worse until Mr. Davies challenged William Roblin to a fight. It was then Mr. Roblin decided to retreat to his own home. Differing reports suggest that Mr. Roblin went home to retrieve his pistol to then shoot Mr. Davies at point blank range into the side of Mr. Davies' head. Other reports argue that instead, Davis pursued Roblin to Roblin's family home, pounding on the door and threatening Roblin. At this point, Margaret Roblin went outside to desperately persuade Davis to leave, fearful of her husband's explosive temper, especially as Roblin and Davies were incredibly drunk. From this, Mr. Roblin rushed outside where a single gunshot rang out. Instantly, Mr. Davies fell to the ground, bleeding excessively. Whichever account is correct, whatever was left of William Roblin's reputation was then in tatters. The wound Mr. Davies had suffered had been described as to the head, an inch wide and three inches deep. It was definitely a gruesome injury, from which Mr. Davies would later succumb to after a few more painful weeks hanging on to life. After the confrontation, Mr. Roblin went on the run, immediately recovering from his state of intoxication and stuck in a sheer state of panic. Oosmaston Parish Constables working together with special constables tried to hunt Mr. Roblin down, though to no avail. This was because Mr. Roblin knew the countryside and was so easily able to conceal himself in several different locations. While on the run, two constables encountered an old woman living at Silver Hill. What was different about this woman, however, compared to other potential witnesses' accounts, was her genuine fear of Mr. Roblin being anywhere nearby and near her home. Mr. Roblin had almost grown as a boogeyman type of reputation, which this woman seemed to take very seriously. The old woman promised both constables every possible assistance she could offer them if Mr. Roblin were to make any sort of appearance. In the end, she didn't turn out to be all that useful, as she wasn't able to or didn't want to turn in any information concerning Mr. Roblin. 18 days after the search started, locals, Griffiths and Corker, had spotted Roblin roaming in Caniston Woods alone. 
They pursued Mr. Roblin and demanded he surrender, but Mr. Roblin refused, instead of running away. But they reacted to this by discharging their firearms onto Mr. Roblin's, though their guns weren't terribly accurate, so eventually lost Mr. Roblin through the trees. After this, Lord Milford even offered a bounty of 40 guineas on Roblin's head, which was unusually large for that period. This didn't aid the capture of Mr. Roblin, so instead both Griffiths and Corker have rewarded five guineas each for their efforts. Instead, it was Mr. Roblin who decided to turn himself in into a Mr. Phillips, a farmer residing at Maryborough in the parish of Whiston. Mr. Roblin begged the farmer to take him into Harriford West, where Mr. Roblin would later hand himself over to the police. William Roblin did this on the 4th of September 1820, hoping that turning himself in would give some kind of merit with the locals, as well as the law. On this day, he had been described as being in utter despair and desperation, but this didn't help William Roblin at all. From turning himself in, Mr. Roblin was never given a lighter sentence or any leeway from the Pembrokeshire constables. He was delivered into the custody of Mr. Jones, the prison governor. The next day, on the 5th of September, he was committed to Haverford West Gaol, where he was placed in Ward 7. Since his victim, Mr. Davis, was still alive at the time in Haverford West's eminent surgeon, Mr. Roblin had only been charged with battery at first. However, Mr. Davies died three agonising weeks after being shot so William Roblin's charges were changed to murder, and he was sentenced and to be hung. Mr. Roblin denies these charges, though that didn't help him at all. During his time incarcerated, William Roblin even encountered a tale of how he was present in the cottage at Silver Hill. According to him, he was present while two constables were questioning the previously mentioned old woman from Silver Hill, who turned out was secretly hiding Mr. Roblin. Despite the old woman getting questioned by the two constables, Mr. Roblin got away with it and resumed life on the run afterward, as she never sold Mr. Roblin out to the law. In total, it took three days to convict William Roblin to be hung. Though Mr. Roblin had received no legal representation and no right to appeal his sentence during this time, suspicion had also arrived that Mr. Roblin's wife, Margaret Roblin, had been an accomplice to her husband. Margaret Roblin had even fled her home in Deep Lake for two days before she was detained by constables with Mr. Roblin's daughter, Little Margaret. There, Margaret and her daughter, Little Margaret, were taken into custody on the 15th of September, 1820. They were later released on the 21st of April, two days before William Roblin's death, though without any contact with their husband and father from Mr. Roblin during that time. During Roblin's time in custody, Mr. Roblin had also attempted to commit suicide by hiding iron pins in the sleeve of his jacket. With these, Mr. Roblin intended to pierce several vital veins in different places to bleed to death. However, Mr. Roblin was unsuccessful in doing so, and stayed alive until his execution, saying, Justice has not been done, but I shall have justice in another world. Mr. Roblin would repeatedly deny having killed William Davis, as well as denying even owning the pistol that was used to shoot Mr. Davis. This, however, was simply not true, as William Roblin had certainly shot Mr. Davis with a gun that Mr. Roblin himself owned. The date had been set for Monday, the 23rd of April, 1821. On the Monday before his execution, Mr. Roblin requested that he see his daughter, saying, I shall never see her again after this. Recounts say that Mr. Roblin was very emotional, begging the prison governor at this time. His daughter and wife were being held in the same prison. On the 23rd of April at 6 o'clock in the morning, Mr. Roblin was hung. Mr. Roblin's last words when asked if he had any were, No, I have nothing. I suppose you want me to confess the murders of which I am not guilty. Some people believe that this was about the mysterious death of the Irish man at his inn. William Roblin also added, I am clear of that, why should I conceal it? They could do no more to me after. Reverend Adams asked him about it in the day of his execution. By this, Mr. Roblin meant that he had no reason to conceal any more information having accepted his fate. A clergyman read a portion of the 55th chapter from Isaiah. Mr. Roblin reportedly hadn't even eaten since Friday, hence claimed to have a pain in his stomach. So, Mr. Roblin called for tobacco, since he enjoyed smoking, but kept his composure throughout the execution, right up until his grisly end. After calling for the tobacco, Mr. Roblin resumed his prayer until the drop fell. Some people say that Mr. Roblin hung from the Haverford West Castle gates, though this has never been fully confirmed or denied. However, we do know there was a lot of interest from the locals surrounding Mr. Roblin's hanging, as it was the first in the town after perhaps 10 years or more. At the point of death, Mr. Roblin was described as an inanimate corpse suspended between heaven and earth by onlookers.
Historians think that thousands of people would have attended Mr. Roblin's execution, as it was a big deal at that time. However, after Mr. Roblin's hanging, his father, Richard Roblin, drunkenly promised to show and explain the bodies of both the Irishman and that of the unknown body that he claimed his son William Roblin had killed. Of course, his father promised this information in exchange for a rather grand five pound. The second unknown body he spoke about was that of a woman who Roblin had buried in his orchard. In support of this, William Llewellyn, who also admitted that Mr. Roblin had told him about a similar story after Mr. Roblin drunkenly confiding in Mr. Llewellyn. To see if this was true, several people went to the site and dug up the orchard in search of this body, though nothing was found. Some people even speculate that Mr. Roblin lied for his own amusement, even through into the afterlife. Sadly, Mr. Roblin was ultimately never laid to rest in peace. Mr. Roblin's body was instead sold to a sailor as a mere curiosity, rather than respectful human remains. By 1914, Dr. Williams of St. David's had Mr. Roblin's remains moved to his house, though today Mr. Roblin's skull is now in Pembrokeshire Castle. It was on display for some time, though now has been placed into storage away from public eye. A lot of people dispute the proper handling that these remains have gone through, arguing that Mr. Roblin was never really given the full respect that he deserved, despite the horrific crimes that he was indeed guilty of committing. The rest of Mr. Roblin's skeleton has been long lost, but the skull still stands as a grisly reminder of his troubled life and the crimes that he committed these 200 years ago. The life and crimes committed by Mr. Roblin will never be forgotten about in the UK. If you would like to see more cases of old crimes committed in the UK, please let us know in the comments below. And as always, thank you for joining us and stay safe.